our speaker today is Tim Alderton, who is a native of Western Pennsylvania. Tim graduated from Penn State University in 2002 with a guest degree in horticulture. Uh, Tim then interned in the education department at Callaway Gardens in uh, Pine Mountain, Georgia. Then moved to Raleigh in March 2005 to accept a position at Plant Delights Nursery. And in the following January of 2006, he started working at the J.C. Ralston Arboretum as a research technician. Tim is a board member of the Piedmont chapter of the North American Rock Garden Society. And he also received the Award of Merit from the North American Rock Garden Society in 2017 in the meeting that was held here in Durham. Tim is here today to tell us about the wildflowers of southwestern Colorado, a particular area around Durango, during a visit that he made last summer for the Rock Garden Society's annual meeting. So please welcome Tim Alderton. Okay, can everybody hear me? Yes. Out there yes. in the, you can hear me, good. Okay, I guess Chris has posted a plan, or a list of my slot, more or less list of my slides. So anyways, so hopefully you'll be able to get access to that. So you won't have to keep up with everything I'm saying. Um, it, I'll probably go too fast, but we'll still go too long despite that. So this is a three hour tour probably uh, of Southwestern Colorado. Like Bobby was saying, the national meeting last year was held in Durango, Colorado, which is in the southwestern part of Colorado for everyone's information. And let's see if this I can make this uh, go forward. What am I doing wrong, Chris? Do I not have the right thing? Ah, there we go. Yeah. My, my flash drive was priority at that moment. Let's see. Right. Uh, still not going. No, we had it earlier, <laughs> Technical difficulties here. We'll see if we can get it figured out. Oh, there. Ah, it worked. So, anyways. Oh, you were doing it for me? So, so am I doing it now? Okay, perfect. So, here you can see a, a map of the terrain, basically, of the southwestern Colorado. Um, so, the key areas here is Durango, Colorado, up here. And, Oh, um, some of the locations we went to were over here, uh, Mesa Verde's in this area. We went to um, Indian Trail Ridge up here, just west of Durango and north, almost up to Silverton, we went to Engineer Mountain. And um, let's see, we went to um, Chimney Rock uh, a National Monument right here in this area. And just up here, north of Pagosa Springs, we went to uh, Lobo uh, Pass or Lobo Overlook and uh, Wolf Creek Pass. So those are the six areas I'll be focusing on in this talk. So, anyways, we're going to get started here. Here's another overview of the Southwest. You can see this is in the Southwest corner of Colorado. You see um, Arizona here at the Four Corners. You got Utah and you got New Mexico. So just to orient, yeah, the Four Corners region. And so our first place that we were started, of course, was where our conference was actually held at Fort Lewis College. And uh, there, uh, we stayed there, or most of the people stayed there uh, in the dorms, and then we had uh, our meeting there in the evenings. But on the hillside uh, below the, the campus itself, there were lots of trails. And my first morning there, I went out and hiked that before I got some breakfast. So these first few uh, photos are gonna be from that area. So here again, you can see uh, on this view, it actually has some of the elevation to it. So this elevation was between 6,800 feet and 7,000 feet, uh, more or less. So we were, again, see these little trails on this area right here. And this is overlooking uh, the town of Durango uh, that morning. And you can see it's somewhat dry. We're, it's not high elevations around it, but to the north, you get more into the green. But um, this is the trails themselves and uh, that go down the hillside. And some of the plants that I saw in that area were one of my perpetual favorites. And actually, one of the plants we gave away today was a yucca bacata, which it actually came from Las Cruces, uh, New Mexico. but. Um, from a trip in 2019, but 
anyways, this is yucca piccata here, the banana yucca. Um, love the foliage on this one here, the specimen. You can see the filamentous growth. It varies a lot from plant to plant. So uh, from also on this trail, we have uh, a plant that's pretty much ubiquitous throughout the entire Southwest that I, in my travels there so far anyways. The heterotheca villosa, the uh, hairy false gold aster. You'll see these um, each summer I'm out there, when I've been out there, I've seen these all over. I always love these little things. Um, uh, don't think of these as wildflowers too often, but some of them sometimes more as weeds, but uh, some of the Solanaceae, the, there were some Physalis, and this is Physalis heterofolia, um, one of the, the ground berries. Uh, this is an ivy leaf form, had interesting flowers, and it looked quite lush in reality compared to everything else around it. So. Uh, some of the woody, other, other woody plants, there were Fendlera rupicola, the cliff Fendler bush. Um, this is really closely related to the uh, mock oranges, the Philadelphus. Uh, it's hard to see in this picture, but the, the, it wasn't in flower, but it had been covered in flowers earlier in the year, apparently. Uh, it would have been nice four petal white blossoms, fragrant. Uh, the seed pods were all over it, but they were some of the added some structure to the, uh, the area. You saw these all over when we were out there in the drier areas. And again, the yucca in the base of that is uh, yucca piccata. Oops, wrong button here. All along the roads out there, I just love seeing sunflowers. They aren't the gaudy giant things that we grow in our, our landscape from seed each year. Uh, these are the true wild uh, helianthus annuus. They are three or four feet tall with branching small inflorescence of like four to three to four inches across. They just uh, all along the roads and here again, there were some uh, right along the trail on the hillside. Harder to see in this one, but uh, many people grow four o'clock. This is not the uh, Mirabilis halapala that we uh, commonly grow in our gardens, but this is Mirabilis linearis, the narrow leaf four o'clock. And it's just a pink flower and a rather sparse plant, but when you actually see them up closer, it's quite cool. And I don't think I realized at the time that there were aphids all over this one, but uh, there's bright orange aphids that are almost as orange as the pollen on this uh, little Mirabilis. Also sticking out from the hillside was Penstrom barbatus, um, with the scarlet bugler. Um, one of the many species of penstones are out there. It wasn't good penstone season. Most of them flower earlier in the season, but this is a th like a three to four foot tall one um, and beautiful scarlet red flowers, just a handful of them still sticking out on this. And here's a close up of, the, uh, of an individual floret. Uh, another plant, a group of plants that here in the Eastern United States we have very few of is Areogonums. In this case, this is, I believe to be Areogonum jamesii, which is pretty common at that, in that area. Um, and I really find these attractive. They don't like our area here in Southeastern uh, the United States. They do not like wet summers whatsoever. There's countless species out in the West. Uh, also in this picture, you can see the yellow in the upper parts of the, uh, the photo. And that's again, the Heterotheca uh, uh, villosa. And here's a close up of the Areogonum. Uh, James E.I. And you're going to see some more of these later on. I really like these, uh, but we saw them at some other locations. Uh, one of the uh, cacti that were out there, one of the cactus species is Cylindra puncha whiplii. We do grow that here in the garden at the Arboretum. Seeing it in the wild was kind of cool, uh, kind of sprawling here on the hillside. Here it was among some boulders, again with yucca baccata and some shrubby oaks and I believe pinion pine. Uh, for a little further down the trail, we, I came across some uh, Erica Muria, um, Nauseosa. The name has changed on this. You may know it as some other names, but one of the rabbit bushes. Uh, three to five feet tall, these get, and they're semi evergreen to evergreen, or that is silver, I should say. And then late summer, you get these really nice yellow inflorescence sticking up off that silver foliage. Um, and uh, these are in the daisy family of all things. So. Um, might not realize that. So. so our second location was actually over at Mesa Verde National Park and we went um, to Longhouse. Nancy DeBrava and I were traveling together along with Cindy um, Cromwell, but Cindy had a, a meeting that afternoon and Nancy was able to uh, go online weeks in advance and procure only one ticket uh, to actually get to one of these um, uh, 
cliff dwellings and she gave it to me and i was really so excited so nancy and i drove over uh to uh mesa verde and uh it's a very twisty turny road i didn't get too many pictures throughout the park but i took uh, quite a few around where we actually stopped um here at um uh near the longhouse uh uh, cliff dwelling. And so uh, on the trail down, uh, I looked at wildflowers, took a few pictures there. It's really interesting. The whole area was burnt over. I don't remember what year. There's been so many fires out there. We were reading as we were going down the road. This fire was in 1915. That one was 1935 and 1986 and 1990 and 2015, you know, and they all look the same. It has the recovery time is so slow due to the lack of water out there. Um, but uh, the skeletons of trees were really cool uh, along the roads. But then you'd have the scrub, the shrubby stuff, and the wildflowers growing among it. So, anyways, this slide here again gives you an idea of the elevation. This is really similar to the elevation that we had uh, at uh, Fort Lewis College, so around seven thousand feet. And this is the actual uh, longhouse um, uh, cliff dwelling here from the ancestral Puebloans. And it was so cool to be able to go and experience these. So anyways, um, some of this, the flora from that area was the lupinus, and this is caudatus, I believe anyways. There's like half a dozen or more different purple lupins out there, but this is supposedly the one that would have been flowering at that time. And it's probably about the most common in that area. So that's my best guess. Uh, we saw several of them throughout the area. And actually going back to that, you can see the skeletons of the, the uh, junipers probably uh, that had they might have been a couple hundred years old when they were killed, you know, 20, 30, 50, 100 years ago. So still there. Uh, not as spectacular, but it was interesting to see was Rubina Bractea. Oh, I thought I corrected this. Anyways, spell, spell check, I hate, you know, Bracteata instead of Bracteate, which it corrected it to so nicely for me. Uh, anyways, so the, the big Bract Rubina. Uh, not big flowers, big bracts. So uh, it was growing along the, tra the, the trail down to um, the site for the hike. Uh, again, Heterotheca velosa. Uh, this is a close up here with a little hair streak type butterfly on it. Um, again, I always find this plant so adorable to see it. And I, it's everywhere out there. Uh, another one that's not as common, but still it's, it's not rare by any means are the Sphaerolacea coccinea, the scarlet globe mallow. I saw the, a few of those uh, along the trail as well. So one of the little hibiscus relatives. The, this was flowering beautifully here and there. This is Asclepias subverticillata. So one of the, the thin-leaved milkweeds. Um, this one is commonly called horsetail milkweed. And it's very much appropriate based on uh, the structure of the plant. But just in full flower, um, I hope you can see that in this photo here. And the insects were enjoying it. In this case, there was a, a nice wasp that was uh, uh, partaking of the nectar. I'm going to get a quick drink here real quick. Pause. Okay. So we're gonna continue on. Um, darn yellow composites, there's a whole bunch out there and I don't always try to figure them out, but I like this one. So I actually tried to figure it out. Um, this is Petrodoria pumilla. So a rock goldenrod, only like six or eight inches tall, uh, forming little tufts and we're, they were in full flower along the trail uh, down to the, uh, the longhouse site. Hard to see in this photo, but we'll see some later on a little bit closer up. But another one of the areogonums, the, the buckwheats, this is areogonum racemosum, and you can see the tall, thin spike. And here's a close up of the flower itself. And again, another hair streak type butterfly on there. Um, and there's probably oodles of other areogonums growing out and among this area. It's just, you have to be an areogonum person to really know them. They're, uh, there's a whole Areogonum society, which I'm not in yet because we don't have enough of them out here, like two species in the eastern U.S. Um, and again, I said we'd see this one again. This is Areogonum jamesii, which we had seen on the hillside below uh, the university or the college as well. And here's a close up, actually, this time of the blossoms. Again, 
I love yucca bicata. In this case, you can actually see the, the fruit, uh, the, the seed pods, and you can see kind of why it's called the banana yucca in this case. And when they actually do ripen, they're fleshy, they aren't dry like many of the other uh, yuccas. The, the capsule actually melts more or less, and they are edible from what I understand. And here again, you can see the yucca bicata growing among, like I said, all those skeletons of past forest fires in this area. Uh, yep. Are the, the like the olive greenish bushes that are starting to grow up uh, the juniper? Uh, no, I'm not sure what those are from this picture. Pardon. Uh, we had a question about the bushes in here. If those were the junipers growing back, I don't think so. Actually, this is a broadleaf uh, deciduous shrub here. I'm not sure what it is offhand. I didn't take a close enough picture to um, to identify it. Uh, from here. I don't remember. This was in August and it was 90 degrees. So uh, on a paved actually trail at this point. But so I didn't take note of that. But on the other side, there is a Fendlora. This is Fendlora right here, which we saw also in um, at the or the college, Fort Lewis College. Um, another group of plants, which there are oodles of them out there. This is one I can't identify. Um, one of the uh, rigerons, in this case, divergence, this little spreading uh, flea bane. Uh, and when you get in the alpine areas, it's like, I don't try to identify them. <laughs> you need to know a little more than me or have more time, more detail. But uh, anyways, that was one there. Uh, this, the uh, rigeron was up on top of the mesa. Now this is down over the mesa um, on the trail, actually down to the, um, the longhouse at um, um, cliff dwelling itself. And this little pink flower here is uh, Stephanomuria, Stephanomuria, yep, I got it. Uh, Tenua folia, the narrow leaf wire lettuce. Um, and uh, interesting to see it. It's uh, a little daisy again. Uh, and the one um, ranger who I was talking with on her way back up she was she actually knew what it was she didn't know the name of it she didn't know it was in the daisy family but she knew it was a wire lettuce uh, and then next to it you again you'll see the little yellow flower of a um, heterotheca but here's a close-up of the flower the light intensity was really high so the color is a little bit blown out uh, on this but it's a little daisy almost no leaves <laughs> Again, growing on the cliff sides were uh, Penstum rostra floris, bridges Penstum. We've grown that here at the garden, does not live very long, but it is beautiful when it flowers. The orange red blossoms are uh, spectacular on these. Uh, and these were hanging from the cliffs. Um, you'd see them 30, 40 feet up some places, but this is one that was right along the trail. And here's another um, little bit more compact one. They're typically only one and a half to two feet tall. Wow. The earlier when we sh I showed you a pencil on Barbados, they get like two, uh, two and a half, three feet tall, easy. But these are, um, Lisa Verde is known for this species of Penstemon uh, in August flowering. So, also uh, along the trail, there was some, were some Echinoceras. And based on the size and shape of this one, I believe this to be Echinoceras uh, coccineus, the scarlet hedgehog cactus. Uh, we grow this one here at the uh, Arboretum. Uh, it does fine here. We also have another um, troglodytus or something like that, which is a little bit bigger form of this uh, uh, kind of cerus. Um, it's basically size, I guess it uh, distinguishes the two. So we're now onto our third location. This was the two previous things. Those were on our own. Uh, now we're getting into uh, some of the organized hikes with the, uh, the NARGs meeting themselves. And the first Dave, or the hike that we did this, I believe this was on the 6th of August, and um, several of us, or let's see, three of us from our chapter went to here, uh, Nancy and Cindy and I, um, Amelia and Richard Lane were also there, and they went to another location, and I don't know where David White went, he might have gone to Mesa Verde, it seems like, but anyways, um, the parking for this was way over here, uh, near this 550 highway, there's a little area and we wove our way up the hillside or the mountainside and you came in from the, the northeast side of the mountain. Uh, we went up to about a little over 12,000 feet that day. And I think the parking lot's like 10.5 or something like that. So um, we had a good 1500 feet elevation change, I think. 
Uh, and here you can see the topography. Am I anywhere close? Uh, actually, about 1,200 feet, I should say, uh, elevation change. Still, it was it was a steep uh, hike. It was a very different than the hike we did the following day. So you'll get to see some of that here. Uh, and um, actually, this area here, you'll see in the next slide. So uh, that's the same hillside there, right above the parking lot uh, for the trailhead. So very steep. Uh, we lucked out this past year. Veratrum californicum was in mass. Uh, mega flowering last year. Everywhere it was in flower, you get to see these four to six foot tall spikes of corn lily um, in blossom, these green uh, with cream, uh, green foliage with cream flowers on it. Uh, really cool to see them in mass uh, all over the place, uh, covering the hillsides. Um, also mixed among these near the parking lot, there was some Circeum perii, the peri uh, thistle. Here you can see a close up of a blossom or inflorescence with a B on it. Uh, also near that area was Hedicerum uh, occidentale, uh, one of the vetches, this is Western sweet vetch. Um, and in this picture, the yellow you'll see here shortly, I, I do have that one identified. So there's a close up of the blossoms. Um, this one here, uh, Helianthella quinquinervis, I believe that to be. Again, like I said, there's so many darn yellow composites out there. Um, this is um, one of the little sunflowers. This was actually growing in the open canopy of the spruce uh, forest that was around. Uh, not out in the open, which I've actually seen it out in blazing sun in other places before. I started to see some of the Castilegias. Uh, this is Castilegia rexifolia, the rosy paintbrush, which really pretty easy to identify as based on its name. So um, we'll see some other Castilegias throughout the, the um, talk. Uh, Aconitum columbianum, um, the Western monkshood, we've seen this one before in other foot locations. And also the Castilegia, I've seen that uh, several other times I've been out in the Western US. It's always nice to see them. And the thing with the Castilegias, um, they're in the Ourobranchaceae, the um, a family of hemiparasitic plants largely. We just have a few representatives of those out here in the Eastern United States, but there's countless um, species of Castilegia, broom rapes, and uh, pendicularis, so the louse warts. And we'll have like one or two of each out here. If we're lucky, they have 15, 20 species of many of these um, genera out there. Uh, it's much more representative uh, family out there. And we'll see several of those throughout the talk. Uh, but again, the aconitum here, always love to see that. Um, the other plant that was in mass flowering this past year, really cool to see. And from another family that's not, it's somewhat underrepresented here in the Eastern United States, uh, the gentianaceae, uh, the gentian family, or in this case, this was a Fraseura speciosa. Um, it's those green uh, spikes there, it's called monument plant for a reason. Uh, they get three to seven feet tall, probably when they're in full flower. There was a mass of flowering. People were saying they've never seen that many. The locals, that is, have never seen the flower that much uh, in their memory. Um, and uh, they don't know the cycle that these things flower. They they aren't. They might flower every 15, 20 years. They don't know. They've, it used to be they thought they were like short, you know, three to five years they'd flower, but no, that's not it. We have another question here in the um, audience. Sorry, I'm curious. So, within the scene of all the wildfires, you have what seems to be a Castilegia? Yeah, that's a Castilegia. It's probably Miniata, would be my guess. Oh, yeah, there was uh, mentioning some of the other wildflowers in this photo. The, the orange in here is probably Castilegia. Um, Miniata and the purple, uh, there's some specks of purple in there. That's one of the er many Erigerons. I can see that. And there's other darn yellow composites in there. So, yeah. And here, this is the rosettes of a uh, non flowering uh, Fraseria. So, you didn't actually see that many of these. You saw all of them in flower. And they're monocarpic. So, they stay in this stage for who knows how long. And then they shoot up a stalk. Um, and flower and uh, set seed and die. So um, one of the composites, not a darn yellow one, it's a darn orange one, uh, Agros, uh, Agrosaurus 
or Antieca, was easy enough that I could identify this one. So it's, this is kind of like a marigold, or not a marigold, a dandelion uh, out there. Um, but you saw these flowering here and there, and you saw some other agrocera species as well. This is one I saw earlier on, I mentioned a little bit with the Hedocerum um, occidentale, uh, the Heliomerus uh, multiflora, uh, showy golden eyes. I actually didn't pay attention to this when I took the picture. I just happened to identify it the other day when I was going through them, uh, selecting photos. I don't know that I've actually ever seen it prior to that day. I have seen it since. So uh, it's interesting what you catch with, uh, when you go back and look at photos. So this was actually the trail going into the woods then. And you can see how steep this is here in this photo, I hope. Nice drop off. Um, and that's why the way most of this hike was going up. Um, we were going through the woods and then uh, the last half or quarter mile probably was actually out in an open meadow. But along the trail, um, I saw some things that I've seen before, but seeing them in different contexts, I've seen them in the open before. Again, these are along the trail in a more woodland setting. This is Anacycle or Ant. And Cyclia, I can't spit it out. I like the old name, Zygodennis. That's what I learned it as, Elegans, the elegant death camis. Um, I just love the flowers of these with the, the white and then the green uh, at the base of each petal. And the Melianthaceae, I believe. Um, another one that you, there's actually quite a few species out there, the Arnicas. Uh, I believe this is Arnica cordifolia, the heart-leafed Arnica. So if we had any muscle strains, we could have made a poultice out of this and used that. It's, uh, so Arnica, it's a, an herb or herbal plant. But anyways, you'd see these growing in the woodlands. Again, the Delphinium barbii. I'm accustomed to seeing this in the open. We were seeing this in, in the open glades, but not, um, not open meadows, which is where I've seen it other times when I've been out there. And this one uh, becomes pretty ubiquitous when, uh, for this trip. I saw this three or four places, and you'll see it later on in the talk, this gentianella uh, amarella, the, the northern gentian, uh, just a tiny little uh, gentian relative. Again, like I said, lots more gentianaceae out there than we have here in the eastern United States. Uh, another one of the orobranchaceae, the pedicularis, uh, this is bracteosa, uh, it's a, a yellow flowered species, the bracteal swart. Uh, again, we just have a couple species of uh, pedicularis out here, and there's several out there, and they're all really cool. The structure of the flowers, you'll see later on in another one. Um, if anybody's been to Yellowstone in the summer and they've gone to Old Faithful, you may have seen this. This is Gentianopsis thermalis. So this grows all around many of the thermal vents out in, in Yellowstone, so hence thermalis, I believe. But the Rocky Mountain fringe gentian, this was in a wetland uh, around the lake that we, uh, a small lake or pond that we uh, passed uh, going up the mountain. And here you can see why it's called a fringe gentian. Uh, here in a close-up of the flower. Another gentianaceae here, the Swartius perennis. I'd never seen this before. Really cool to see this. This is again growing in the, the boggy soils around the, the pond, uh, fellwort. Um, I just find these so cool looking. They look like they're glass to me, blown glass flowers with the purple and just how uh, it's, um, the veining so intricate on them. Also in the same area, and you saw this actually right back here, um, uh, is the Rhodiola rhodantha, uh, queen's crown. This is a sedum, and I always see these growing in wet places. You don't think of sedums growing in wet places. So um, there's another species we'll see later on at a different location. Also, and actually within the pond, I've never seen uh, min uh, minianthes, the trifoliata, the bog bean. Uh, it was growing out there. Uh, it was interesting to see that. And uh, this is something you see pictures from the Arctic in the area uh, forum uh, in Gustafolium, the cotton grasses. And also in this picture, you can see some of the purple um, or bluey purples of the Swartia in here. And our next plant, which the, most of them in here are spent, but then, uh, there were some Pedicularis groenlandicas. I always find this plant so cool. And hence, it, the flower really tells you why it's called what it's called, the you know, elephant's head. You can really see that in the intricate shape of those blossoms. Continuing, we're finally getting up out of the forested area. Uh, uh, right where we were at, there were both um, Castilegia rexiflora, or rexifolia, I should say, and 
Castilegia occidentalis, and you get these intergrades between them. And this is uh, one that Mike Kinchin, who was uh, from Denver Botanic Garden, um, he said these were probably hybrids. So um, this is just a kind of a cool one there, and just a few feet over. This is probably an occidentalis in the foreground, and then above is um, maybe rexifolia up there. So hence you get the uh, the hybrids. And then this is the mountain itself where we were going. Um, we end up going over this little ridge over here, just onto the um, rock scree on the other side of that. So it's, it's just a spectacular view of the mountain. And there were people climbing it. You could see a very right up on the top of it when we were there. If I had this whole pitch, if I actually zoomed in on this picture, you could see little people. We didn't go that high. So anyways, this was the trail once we got out into the meadow. It was a little bit eroded. That trench is like three or four feet deep. So um, you didn't dare fall in. You might break an ankle. Um, and this is the rock glacier that, uh, or uh, the scree that we went to. Uh, and you'll see some photos from here in a moment. Um, once you started over into that area, we started to see some other wildflowers. Here's Phlox condensata. The dwarf flocks, nice fragrant little flocks. I've seen this uh, further up and um, up around Denver, and I believe in Wyoming other times. So, but always very high elevation. And the elevation we're at right around here is about twelve thousand feet. So, uh, another high elevation planter, the Sarlini acalis, um, the moss champion. Seeing them in full flower, and this area is <laughs> we were uh, Mike Kinjan here. Um, he was searching for Ranunculus macaulayi, which Mike wrote a, uh, I mean, a flora for Colorado wildflowers in the last, I'm not, in the last couple of years. And he had never seen this plant actually in the wild. So he was really diligently trying to find this uh, uh, little Ranunculus, which we did end up finding several throughout this area. So uh, after finding that, we all sat down and ate lunch on this slope above this area. And I, I, after I ate my lunch quickly and others were still uh, eating, I took a few more photos. And um, this was just one of the Mertensias, one of the bluebells. I think I asked um, Mike what this one was and he wouldn't even give me a definitive answer. There's so many different Mertensias out there. but spectacular when they're um, that intense of blue. And we'd see some bigger ones down in the forest glades, but this was only like six or eight inches tall. Uh, the others were up to two to three feet down lower elevations. And you, this picture gives you an idea how steep it was. Um, there's a wallflower here down in the foreground and that's uh, their uh, Rissimum capitatum, the Western wallflower. Um, and then above that, there were some of the trifolium attenuatum, uh, the Rocky Mountain clover, and they were in full blossom in this location. I saw some other places lower down where they already passed flowering. So, yep, another question here in the. So, does that just clover also have three leaves? Yes. Uh, the question was do these, uh, tri these clovers have three leaves? And yes, these have three leaflets. Um, they're much more thin and they're kind of held. Uh, they aren't splayed out like what we think of as clovers. They're kind of held more like your fingers. Um, put three fingers up and it's kind of, they're more that way. So it gives them a totally different look. But yes, they are trifoliate. Also up there, this is again, the Castilegia occidentalis, which I mentioned earlier, where we were getting hybrids down lower elevations. So, and actually I didn't even pay attention. Oh no, I guess that's just more of the clover in the picture, but. Um, uh, we started back down a little bit, and this is just a, across the um, the ridge a little bit, going back towards the uh, trail, and we came across some uh, Gentiana algida, the whitish gentian. Uh, that was the first time seeing that one. Here's a close-up of the blossoms. Love the flecking in the um, the dark patches on it on the, between the petals or the mid vein of the petals, I guess. Uh, also, in, right in that same area, or was this giant plant? If anybody Andros, uh, has seen this one, they'll know that I'm being very facetious there. Um, the Androstasy streptomenalis, I believe it's a little annual. It only gets like two to three inches tall. So 
uh, there were some big patches of that uh, in relatives, uh, <laughs> relative big patches. And here's a, a close up of an individual one. Uh, beautiful little plant in the primrose family. And oh, I didn't get my formatting right there, but that's okay. Um, anyways, uh, and they were growing actually not that far from a primrose, a, a true primrose, Primula perii, uh, in this uh, same little location, which we hadn't seen. And I think these are the only ones I saw that looked really nice in flower um, on the trip. Uh, we saw a few plants the following day. But. And another plant that was, uh, this is endemic to, I think to down in the Southern part of Colorado and Northern uh, New Mexico, this Veronica or, I, um, that we were told the name Bessia um, Ritteriana, the Ritter's uh, kitten tail. We had seen some down near the parking lot, but they had already gone to seed. Uh, we found one that was actually in flower yet. So um, many of the other Bessias are soft purples and pinks, which I've uh, seen a couple other species on other trips. So it was interesting to see a yellow flowered species. Uh, going back down into the woods, we passed a whole lot of these on the way up. And this is another pedicularis, like I said earlier, the, the Orobranchaceae is so much more represented out there. Um, I'd like this species. I've seen this at Mount Rainier. I've seen this in um, uh, near Santa Fe in the, the ski slopes there as well. Um, but I'd like this pedicularis racemosa, the sickle top loose, uh, loose wort. Um, it looks quite different from any of the other pedicularis that uh, we saw on the trip. So, so we're to our, let's see, fourth location here, Indian Trail Ridge, which this took us to our highest elevations. I uh, wrote an article, I think we were up to about 12.2. I looked up the other day, I think the point we went to is actually 12.3 something. So we got up there pretty high. Um, and you can see in this uh, photo here, that uh, we started the Kennebec Trail uh, head and we went across the ridge here. This is all pretty level through this part right here. And then it goes up uh, from there. Um, several of the people on our trip, they stopped or hike stopped at the lake. They didn't go any higher. Uh, but then there was another 10 or 15 of us that went the whole way up to uh, a rock shelter that's up there where it says Indian Trail Ridge, uh, which, that, this was my favorite day uh, of the uh, of the the trips that we took and the hikes we did. So, so this again, this shows you some of the topography uh, of the area and the relative levelness of this part. And then you get up here, and it's uh, it goes right up. And I don't like heights. And Cindy was with me as we were doing this. And uh, yeah, I was I was in the front of the pack, but leery about me myself anyways <laughs> i don't like uh, steep slopes so to get to this though we had to go on a very rough road um you had to have an off-road vehicle package on the vehicle to get there um it took us probably half an hour from the main road in just to go a couple miles on this road uh and it was bumpy <laughs> slightly so but once we got up to the Kennebec uh, trailhead, I, like I said, it's very level. And here you can see this uh, going across here towards the, uh, over here is where the lake is over here, so. But the hillsides above some, uh, or actually wildflowers were all along the trail. And but this was a hillside that I couldn't get up, to, or I could have gotten up to, but I didn't take time to go up to. But it was just covered in areogonum, or not areogonums, erigerons. Like I said, I don't try to identify the erigerons. So this is a spa. Uh, and um, there's also some uh, Senecios in here, uh, uh, Atrada, I believe. And then you'll see some Castellegias in here. And it looks like there's some spent clover. So the Trifolium attenuatum is in here as well. But the main display was the erigeron in there. That was way up the hillside. I had to use my zoom lens to get this. So, But right along the trail, um, this plant, it's all over the Northern Hemisphere. I adore seeing it though. I think I've even seen it here in North Carolina. Campanulata rotundifolia, the harebells. Uh, just an adorable little campanula. And again, I showed you this one earlier. Uh, Gentianella amarella was right again next to the trail, the Northern Gentian. And more of the delphiniums. Um, there would just be big patches of them. And here's a, another patch 
Don't ask me anything about the APAC, the carrot relatives in the background. I did not pay attention to them whatsoever. So maybe Lagusticum, but no clue. To ver or I won't verify that. <laughs> Uh, another gentian that we saw here uh, was Gentiana perii. They were not open here. Um, Justin Bud, they close each day and we were there early enough in the morning. And it was actually quite cool when we got there. I was kind of in shock. I was wearing shorts. Thank goodness I had a jacket. There was a 30 mile an hour wind at times and it was um, probably 50 degrees. So it was chillier than I expected. Um, when the day before it was very nice and pleasant. Uh, in the, probably the 60s and 70s on our trip. So uh, this is just a view of starting up the, the mountain. Um, way over here, you can actually see that's our destination over there. And you can faintly see the trail going across the ridge here uh, on this one in the foreground. So, And so I said about the Veratrum earlier being in a mega bloom. That is Veratrum californicum all through that. Uh, that picture there, just everywhere. It was really cool to see that above Lake Taylor. Uh, at one of the bends in the trail was uh, this Heterotheca schneideri, which I guess used to be lumped into Heterotheca cumilla. It's actually bigger to me than that of the Heterotheca um, villosa that I have seen everywhere else and pointed out everywhere else, but it grows at a higher elevation. Um, different setting than uh, Velosa. It's not as widespread. Um, the flowers are, or the inflorescence are much larger too, probably two to three times the size. Some more of the Castellegias, and this was just a really attractive purple leaf form of um, Occidentalis. And a few feet away, there's just a plain green one here. And you can see the um, uh, Trifolium attenuatum here as well, the Rocky Mountain clover, but they're spent in this picture. So. Yes. So all of these castellegias, what are they parasitizing? Um, so the question is, what are the castellegias parasitizing on other forbs around them? They, they aren't, I think they can live on their own if they have to, but they um, they are, they typically are parasitic. They're, um, darn, what's the term? Um, <laughs> they are hemiparasites. So they still have chlorophyll. They can still make nutrients, uh, 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 through photosynthesis on their own, but they um, they like to steal some of their neighbor's nutrients. So um, it's other things, maybe that clover right next door to it, or uh, what else is in the picture? There's grasses, there's yarrow here. So that's probably where they're, they're putting their hostoria over in and stealing from them. Uh, this is again, the trail. This is where I didn't like it. That's, you know, right through here is the trail, goes around that. <laughs> I don't like this. <laughs> I kept my eyes the other way <laughs> towards the, uh, the uphill side. Um, so uh, in there, this didn't look too spectacular, but this is pretty cool. This is, uh, we saw this earlier, uh, but I didn't see them in seed like this. This is the Arisimum uh, capitatum, and you can see the seed pods on these things. The Salix were like four to six inches long um, above the foliage. And here's the close-up of the, the, the couple remaining flowers. And among those rocks, actually, oops, right here, you can see them here. This is uh, the chameleon, uh, angustifolium, or epilopium. You may have uh, used to know it as the fireweed. This plant is actually found here in North Carolina, too, in the mountains. I've seen it in Oregon and seen it in Colorado and New Mexico. Uh, I think it goes all over the Northern Hemisphere. I think it's in Europe and Asia as well. So wide distribution, but it doesn't like it down here. We're at in the Raleigh area. But we get to the top uh, above all that rock outcrop and we get start to get some of the meadows again. And in this picture here, you got some Bistorta, Bistortoides and also the Rhodiola, Rhodantha. Actually, I have that name wrong. It shouldn't be Rhodantha. That's Integrifolia. Uh, not Rodantha. It's a little bit different color. Uh, and I tend to see this species on a little bit drier situations. But the meadows were just spectacular uh, up there. So, uh, And then this is looking across the ridge. The lake is down here uh, on this area here. Uh, 
We had just come from down here. And there's another trail that goes out around that way. We did not go that way. But I um. oh, take that back. I'm looking. I that flipped around. This is where we're going to. We're going up to that plane up there. We're going up there. And I, this is another spot I did not like whatsoever. <laughs> As Cindy can tell you, I was crouched down on the ground. Everybody else is walking upright, but I'm afraid I'm going to get blown off the ridge uh, right there. But anyways, continuing on. Um, this is one of the Hymenoxus. There weren't a whole lot of them in flower, but the Hymenoxus grandiflora, the old man of the mountain. Uh, I always love seeing these. They're disproportionately large in fluorescence over top of little plant. Uh, the plant will just be a couple inches tall, and then there's this four-inch in fluorescence on it. So uh, they really stand out. In a rocky scree situation, um, uh, there was the Senecio and plectins. Um, we also did see this in a little bit more grassy areas. This one is just really pretty with all the rocks around it again. And the purple uh, veining, or the purple, yeah, the purple tones that it took on, probably due to a little bit more stress of water in this location. Uh, but it was really windy here. And again, this is the trail. And there's Cindy and a bunch of the other participants. Um, Marcella here is in the middle. She's actually visited. She was one of our speakers. She was up visiting from Argentina. So, um, but there were bicyclists on this trail. Well, it's like how in the world? But, uh, anyways, and yeah, this is the trail again. <laughs> and among those rocks though on that trail, I did, since I was crouched down, um, I did notice a few things. This is not the most spectacular plant, but I noticed it there. And I didn't have to look over the cliff on the one side and the rock scree that I could have fallen on. On the other side, uh, this ox, uh, oxyria, oh, I can't spit it up, oxyria, uh, uh, dinina, um, alpine mountain sorrel. So this is re um, related to dock, more or less, that weed in your yard, in your garden. And another plant that was squeezed in there uh, was Saxifraga uh, bronchialis, the spotted saxifrage. Okay, so we got past that rocky, thin strip, and it opens up again into another little meadow on the other side, um, actually into a big meadow. But before we went up to our destination, uh, did see a few other things, and this was another of the... Uh, Gentiana algidas, uh, the whitish gentian again. And again, I just find those so spectacular that the uh, patterning on them, the, the flecks of dark against the, the white. Um, a Southern Rockies endemic, um, Castalegia haydeni, uh, was also up in this area. Uh, so, the, oh, actually, let's go back here. This is also that Senecio uh, plectrans uh, that we saw a few minutes ago uh, uh, up in there. So, but, and unknown erigerons that I, again, won't mess with. And um, here's a close-up of the Castalegia Hayden I though. Beautiful, these are found in alpine areas only. So. And this is our lunch. It was up here on top of the ridge. Uh, uh, just a little of 30 feet from there, there was a rock um, shelter that had, I don't know who built it. I couldn't find any of the history on it. I was hoping to. I don't know if the Native Americans built it or if it was built by just someone going by, but uh, you'll see some stuff from that later on. But uh, just below us was this meadow full of penstemons and darn yellow composites and castalegia. This is penstemon uh, whipplianus here, uh, whipple's penstemon. I've seen this other places. <laughs> Always love this one. Uh, most commonly they're seen in the purple form. There's also cream colored ones. I didn't see any on this trip, but. Um, and you can also see some of the Bistorta, Bistortoides there, the, the white uh, in that uh, photo as well. Pink is Castalegia, um, probably Rexifolia. I don't think this is Hayden and I, but it, uh, in this situation, but. And again, unidentified erigerons, maybe Glacialis. I won't say for certain on that. Um, and again, looking down and up there is the where we came across you can see the the um trail there and uh in that photo yep um the yeah this was above tree line here the trees there weren't any trees on this area uh, cindy can tell you the same thing she was here um 
trees were uh, at lower elevation, so, but not that much lower. Because um, these trees over here, that's probably, this is about 12, three, right where this is at. That's probably, mm, it's a little over 12,000 feet over here where you're seeing all these uh, spruce and probably fir. But they were in the sheltered side, the leeward sides, uh, not the windward sides of the, uh, the cliffs. So this is up in the rock shelter, um, the Claytonia megariza, um, alpine spring beauty. So we have spring beauties here. But these are real fleshy. They have a super long tap root that goes way down in between all the rocks and crevices. Um, but in this rock shelter, I also like wildlife. So uh, I was just so tickled. We actually saw these before we sat down to eat, but they were down the slope a little more in that meadow. They moved up into the rock shelter and I got within like 10 feet of them, uh, these ptarmigans. Uh, and then I guess there was also a, an angelica gray eye there too, but the ptarmigans were the thing. Um, these are about, they go a little bit further south into uh, Northern New Mexico, but you don't, the other place, they go up to the Rockies and then all the other ptarmigans are um, circumpolar in the Arctic regions more or less. Um, so it's, you don't get to see these here in the Eastern United States, needless to say, uh, and very rare out there. Um, again, this is 12,300 feet. They were as content as ever. There's two females here and a chick. We saw five um, total there that were um, going puttering around um, in this area. And then there was also pica, which I have pictures with the pica. And in the background, there is the, the ptarmigan as well. I took over 100 pictures probably of the ptarmigan and the pica. Um, Pica only occur at the highest elevations. If something, they don't go down in elevation, they can't go anywhere, they're gonna go extinct. Um, in the lower 48 probably would be my guess uh, in the next hundred years or so. But he's collecting hay, they are active year round um, and he stashes it. So this is his hay, his hay mow, as I would call it back home uh, for our cattle that we'd have hay, uh, but he has stashed it in all the crock crevices within the shelter that was there. So, so we started back and uh, near that uh, thin part, I didn't like to go across on the other side, there was a yellow bellied marmot setting. So I had to get his picture too. So I like them. They aren't as bad as groundhogs. They, you know, they're only up in the alpines. They don't come down in your gardens and eat everything. So, and I'm from Western Pennsylvania for those who didn't realize that in the, uh, the talk in the county that has um, uh, Groundhog Day originated. Uh, Punxsutawney is about 20 miles from where I'm from. So I actually despise groundhogs. Uh, <laughs> if this was to go back down uh, that same area, I showed you the picture with the cliff you know, that you can see the trail there. Uh, and again, there were bicyclists going on this. <laughs> it's like, you're gonna kill yourself. <laughs> and then the lake off on the side, you can see it. And that's where we, um, m uh, many of the other people ended up in that area right there, uh, who didn't go up real high. Uh, and just before we got back to the parking lot, I'd seen these earlier, but I got a good picture of the Senecio Bigelovii variety Hallii here. And there's a couple of uh, color variations you can see in this picture, more of the yellow. And then this one has more of the um, purpley uh, colored bracts around the florets. Okay, so we're on to our second to last destination. This uh, location, uh, Cindy uh, is why we went there mainly. Um, in 2019, on our last pre uh, trip that the a group of us take, um, Cindy, Cindy heard about this uh, curtilus uh, that uh, was three or four feet tall, and it was just over this, the. Um, we were in New Mexico, and uh, and so it was just over the state line in in Colorado, but it was four hours from where we were staying. So we decided she couldn't go. <laughs> we were only an hour and a half from it this time, so. Um, and I actually wanted to see it this time. So we uh, went to um, Lobo Overlook in the Wolf Creek Pass area um, to see this Corridalis. And um, just again, you can see the terrain there and you can see the elevation change. So the Corridalis were right down here all along this area here. But we did drive up to Lobo Overlook and see a few things as well. So um, 
So it's right on the Continental Divide, uh, right there. And so right across the road is where we saw the Corydalus. So they were at about 10,850 uh, feet roughly. So, And here's Cindy with her first prize, Corydalus. Uh, <laughs> As you can see, most of us think of Corydalus as these small herbaceous perennials that are only a couple inches tall, maybe a foot if you're lucky. And we can barely grow them here in the Southeast. So um, uh, these were four feet tall anyways. Um, and here's the flowers. And this is mid or early August and they're still in full flower uh, and in seed. <laughs> uh, but here's a close up of the blossom, so. Uh, we did see a few other things there. Um, this is a little Solidago, or so a, a goldenrod. This is Solidago simplex, Mount Albert uh, goldenrod. And again, there's the um, uh, Campanula uh, rotundifolia in here, and there's some yarrow and uh, various other things growing in among these things, but in these meadows. Uh, here's a close up of the uh, goldenrod, as well as these moths. These are uh, cop car moths. So that black and white, it's like a cop car. And they were literally everywhere. They were fluttering. They loved all the yellow things that were in flower at that point. I do have videos of those, but I did not put any in here, so. Uh, finally, we saw the Gentiana perii actually open. We were there a little bit later in the day and it was warmer, so they, they actually opened up for us. And we saw these right down at both at the, um, um, uh, Wolf Creek Pass itself, and then up on top of the mountain at, uh, near Lobo um, Overlook. And again, I told you you'd see this again, uh, the Gentianella uh, amarella. I just was taken by these little things. Um, and there, there was also the Gentianopsis uh, thermalis here too, but I didn't post, I put that in this, just not, you know, 30 feet from those. So I didn't see Elgata there, if I remember right though. On top of the, um, in the mountain, there were sedums, uh, Lancea latum. I did see a species of penstem or one of the blue ones up there. I don't know which one it was, didn't try to identify it, but um, there were uh, several other things up there. We had a nice little walk. But this is the from the overlook and uh, the um, down through here is where you found the Corydalus. And Cindy's picture was taken like right in here. Uh, so we uh, we're going back down, and this is right along one of the the road, um, uh, the dirt road. It was right here is the road um, that went up to Lobo Point, and just beautiful wildflowers again. Castalegia here, the white is uh, Anaphilus um, uh, uh, Mar margaritaceae. I can't spit it out this morning. The pearly everlasting, and I've seen this throughout uh, all throughout the Western United States. It's nice just to see some familiar faces. The red in the background is probably a Castalegia miniata or something like that. Uh, but anyways, uh, this was just fluttering. If I had the video from this spot, this is where we saw literally hundreds of the. Um, uh, uh, cop car moths. So this is Senesa Co uh, astratus, which we had seen this the day before at um, uh, Indian Trail Ridge as well. But there's Cindy in the background, and but this is covering the bank and the Castalegias in here as well. So, so uh, let's see. This is our final destination. We were just here for a little while. Uh, Indian Trail, or that is. Um, Lobo Point, I didn't look at the elevation there. It's probably about 11,000 feet. Um, so this was about oh, 20 miles southwest of there. Uh, we went to Chimney Rock National Monument. Uh, you can't see them real well in here, but up here is the actual Chimney Rocks. They're really cool looking in person. And there's uh, ancestral Pueblo and uh, site here. They believed it, uh, they used it for an astrolo uh, astrological site. Certain time, I think every 18 years, the moon lines up there near the uh, winter uh, solstice. It goes between these two columns um, of stone, which you'll see here in just a moment. So but you can see the, the elevation here. We parked here and walked up. I did not like that walk either. This is a very, this is very thin through here. I don't like thin drop offs. Um, and it was like 90 degrees. And after being up at a nice pleasant 70 degrees where we had just been, uh, it was somewhat of a shock. So but here's one of the uh, remnants of the structures up there. Uh, 
and then those are the the chimney rocks and the moon supposedly lines up somewhere right in here uh, at a certain time every x number of years so uh, but some of the plants that were there again we saw Areogonum racemosum before uh, at Mesa Verde uh, another Areogonum Areogonum launch launch of film which is this one up here and i didn't put it in here but this is james the eye again so um it's one you saw all over uh cactus escobaria vivipara we grow this actually on the roof garden here at the arboretum and i think this is my final slide for those who have been putting up with my three-hour tour here uh castellegia integra uh the foothills pen or the paintbrush so this was growing up there as well. So uh, hope I haven't bored anybody to death uh, sitting at home, uh, but uh, that's just a quick overview of some of the things we saw on our trip this past summer out to this Southwestern Colorado. I hope you've enjoyed it. Any questions? Can I turn the lights on for us real fast, Tim? We did have a couple online questions that I think were a little similar. Someone asked how long a particular hike, hike was, but I missed exactly what hike it was. But talk just um, maybe a little hikes, bit about how long all your hikes were. Um, the ones we did on our own weren't necessarily that long. They were relatively short. But the ones with the uh, NARGS meeting, um, let's see, I'd say we probably got there 9.30, 10 o'clock in the morning. What do you say? At your destination, typically, you, you'd leave about 8. 8, 8.30, depending on where your place was going. And um, you drive anywhere from half an hour to an hour and a half, I think, on some of the furthest ones. Um, so um, you got started relatively early. Uh, for the Indian Trail Ridge, I think we, ha we had lunch around noon at the top, and then we started back down. Uh, just the, the drive out, in and out, is to the main road was the long part of it. It really wasn't that far from Durango. <laughs> it was like a 15, 20 minutes, maybe half an hour longest from uh, until you of paved road. And then a half an hour, 40 minutes of rough, rough, rough road. Um, the trip to, um, um, to uh, Engineer Mountain, that um, again, the time-wise, it was probably, let's just say a three, Three, three to four hours, uh, the actual hikes themselves, but the it was maybe a half an hour drive and we just, that was in our regular car. You pulled off along the, the road and parked in a parking lot. Uh, so it really wasn't that bad. So I don't know, does that answer that person's question? Yeah, I think it does a pretty good job. But and it's Sandy readily was... accessible, except if, especially if you have an off-road vehicle, you can get almost anywhere out there, but um, uh, there's so many places you go out there just in general that you don't need any special vehicle to go to. Sandy was wondering how you navigate the traffic on the paths. You, you talked about the bikes and she was wondering how. There, fortunately, there weren't that many bikes, but it was just the fact that there was a bike. I could not believe that someone was riding a bike on this. Yeah, but still. <laughs> Cindy said there, there had been a, like a race or something the day before or something. And it from... It, yeah, they're doing it night and day. It's like, how do they not kill themselves um, when they're doing it night? We saw the tail end of it, but um, still, but people hike this, the, the trail, that's part of the Colorado Trail. I think it more or less starts at Kennebec uh, Trailhead, but it goes the whole way to Denver. And I think it takes a month is what they said yeah. to do. Yeah. 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 Well, we saw a lot of bikes on one of our hikes and you just had to step off the trail and let the bikes go by. Yeah. Sheriff Nancy does that kind of biking in California. And people do kill themselves. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm not one to kill myself. Um, like I said, I don't like steep slopes. I'd rather be up a tree climbing it than to be have the, have the steep slope next to me sometimes. So this was definitely a plant talk, but I think it was Marilyn asked, "Do you see any herbivores?" But I, I, I mentioned we, that you do um, like to photograph the not animals. Not so much. On, uh, we like oh, right on campus. It, the there were there were deer roaming around all the time, and I think did I see? 
there were raccoons. The, you know, I saw deer right on campus, the mule deer. I mean, you'd be driving down the road middle of the day. Actually, you had to dodge deer going up the hill to the campus. Um, they were just strolling along, eating. There was a doe and a couple fawns. And I saw a buck one morning when I was out early at like 5.30, 6 o'clock uh, uh, on a walk. Um, so, yeah. Well, I think I have addressed all the online questions. If I haven't gotten to it already, that just means I've lost track of it in the chat. So you can go ahead and ask it again. So it's right there in the bottom. But any more questions here in person? Looks like Cindy has one. Well, I just I just really wanted to comment. Thank you so much for helping me relive that wonderful <laughs> trip. I forgot how cool just the hikes were. And for anybody who is kind of sad they didn't get to go, I just wanted to tell you, if you are a NARGS member, you can see all the wonderful lectures we saw for free online. And uh, we had so we were just talking about Craig Child, yes, the archaeologist. Wonderful. He gave the most powerful talk I've mm -hmm. ever seen in my life, and I'm pretty old. It was it was amazing, and you get to see that. And it wasn't even a plant talk. It, it was. It was a cultural. It was and, everything, and, including a musical performance. Yeah, it was he did wild. play a, a flute. <laughs> but I mean, for any of the, I mean, some his excellent books, they're easy reads. They're, he tells you history, and it's um, it, it's just put in a, such an easy way to to take in. It's it's nothing complicated. It's it, it, but he it's through his own experiences. But he tells you the history of places, and I I've, I'm on my third book from him. Um, I've loaned another one, the first one I had away already, but I want to get his new book that's coming out that he actually talked about during the, um, the meeting, which it doesn't come out until I think March or April. That is to get a hard copy and get it earlier digitally. Any What's other questions? Comments? Well, looks like no more questions. Oh, maybe someone's calling in a question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. I see no more questions online, Tim. Just a whole bunch of kudos. They all say thank you very much for a great presentation, great photography. Someone commented, you must spend hours on the uh, research for the plant names, and I know you did. Uh, so thank you very much for doing that for yeah, all of us. Since I accidentally didn't save my document and <clears throat> I had to redo it yesterday, last night when I got home from work. Yes. Um, First thing Tim I had a Windows, uh, you know, it did it updated a couple times, and it's like I didn't pay attention. It was the second or third time it had updated while I was working on the pro, uh, the thing, and I hadn't saved it. And I got home last night, and it updated, and then I went to get back to it, and it's gone. And that my document last Tim night, means so. PowerPoint presentation, so, so he had to redo it all again yesterday. I unfortunately had all the pictures in one spot; just had to throw them in. But then I had to recheck re my name. So fun, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I worked on it till. 10 last night, so. Someone said, yikes. Any concluding so comments? Another oh, question over here. I just have a Nikon, uh, is it a D6 something? The question was, what kind of camera does Tim use? Any concluding comments, it's Cindy? It's a DSLR. I just want to thank everybody who attended in person and online today. This was an outstanding program and hope to see more, more and more of you in person as the weather improves and hopefully the world improves its situation. And uh, this was a great way to get back. And thank you, Tim. You're welcome.